Welcome, everybody, to our session in Hebrews. Uh, We are finally in Hebrews 11, uh, verses 1 to 7. This is a much-loved and just beautiful passage. Uh, We're in the great hall of faith. Uh, The author leads his readers here to inspire and encourage them to just press on and trust in Christ. This section goes all the way through to chapter 12 where he urges his readers there to just fix their eyes on Christ and keep going. But real quick, as we start the Hall of Faith, I just want you to to know that the Hall of Faith isn't here so that we say ooh and ah to the the people who are cataloged in it. And it's not here so that we would try to muster up your faith to be like them. It's all about faith in God and how God proves trustworthy uh, when we trust him, as we'll see. Uh, So let's review the the flow of the context just briefly from last week because the author has actually already shared the information in chapter 10 that he'll now be explaining here in chapter 11, verses 1 to 7. In chapter 10, if you remember, he's encouraging them. And he's doing that because something massive happened in them when they heard the word of God that didn't happen in other people. There was a new reality inside them that then displayed itself outwardly to others. And what he says is, judgment is not at the end of the path you're walking on. Instead, eternal life is there at the end waiting for you. Because that new reality inside of you is faith. God gave it to you. And by God's grace, you're on the path of faith that always ends in eternal life. And that's his encouragement. And importantly, in that encouragement, he points out two things about faith. And this is what helps us to understand chapter 11. Think of it like this. Faith has this solid vertical connection to God and the joys of heaven, essentially. He says that Christ is reserving treasures in heaven for you, which will be yours at some point in the future. And yet today, by faith... You have received already a real joy in those things now. A joy that just towers over other joys in the world. And when you were clear on that, the author says, when you knew the joy that was yours in Christ and what he offers you in his promises and what you've received, that vertical connection, when you knew what was yours in Christ, look at how you lived. This living is the horizontal that he brings out in chapter 10 as well. In verse 34, he says, look at how that reception displayed itself outwardly. He said, the government robbed you of your stuff, but your life's response was joy. So this is the key here. When you know Jesus promised eternal life to those who would willingly leave behind every possession in the world to have eternal life with Christ, And then the government comes and takes away your worldly possessions that you already have to abandon anyway. You could see the situation like these readers did. The government was basically doing them a favor. They're taking away things that just weigh you down on your journey to heaven in one sense. They're they're just taking away obstacles in your path. And so the readers rejoiced because they know they can't take anything with them anyway. And that's what he's going to get to in chapter 12 as well. Uh, But in summary, we really have two elements of faith. Number one, the vertical enjoyment of heaven and really what's yours in Christ. And number two, this horizontal display of that in your life. Those are the two descriptions of faith that he gives in 1034. So that's the big picture review to catch us up to speed. And now we come to Hebrews 11, where he shows us that they're not the only ones like this. The readers... Scripture has a loud and clear testimony that the path thereon has been walked before, the path of faith. By God's grace, they'll make it, he says, because you have faith. Because if you look at all these other people who have had faith, they make it. And in our text, he repeats in verses 1 and 2 this vertical, horizontal description just to bring it to fresh memory. And then he shows us how that kind of faith, that Vertical and horizontal faith is all over the Bible in verses 3 and following. So we'll see his point one in our outline is this description of faith in verses 1 and 2. 
If you read this, it says, Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. And you'll see here that I'm choosing the Christian Standard Bible for verse 1 and the New American Standard Bible for everything after that because the New American Standard Bible substitutes for these words reality and proof, something a little more subjective. It it calls it assurance and conviction, both of which are true and fine, uh, but the author is wanting to highlight something here that's a little more objective and and a little different from uh, assurance and conviction. So I'm just inserting this in here for the sake of ease. In this first phrase, that faith is the reality of what is hoped for. This is the vertical. This is those things that you are presently holding now from God, even though they're only yours in promise. Faith is the present possession and enjoyment of glorious future realities to come from God. You can see that faith is currently the reality of what is hoped for for the future. That's where you get this present possession, this present reality possession of things that are hoped for to come in the future. That's the vertical. And the horizontal is the second phrase, that faith is, faith is the proof of what is not seen. This is the horizontal display of faith. This This is to say when faith lives, it shows. Faith in someone is the fruit of God's invisible work. When faith is real and alive, others see you enjoying God more than everything. Like these readers, when the government's stealing their possessions, they just enjoy Christ. They don't live in a way that confuses other people and sends mixed messages about where your treasure is. And when men lived this way, verse 2 says, When they received God's grace and affirmed that and added nothing of their own to it, but so treasured God's grace as to live differently, what is this? By faith, by these realities, the men of old gained approval. They were approved. God approved them and said, this is the kind of person that I have saved. This is the kind of person that honors me. This is the kind of person that glorifies me on the earth, the person who receives my grace. Now, this principle and this this reality of faith is now displayed as point two on our outline in verses three to seven. We're only going to verse seven today. Faith displays its characteristics, and we're going to learn what those are. Okay, so verse three, if we come down here to verse three, we're going to see that We're basically going to see and answer the question of what faith sees. One of the characteristics of faith is what it beholds, what it sees. And the short answer is, it sees the invisible word of God behind all things. Now read this. It says, by faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. In other words, as God's own invisible word went forth, it created the visible heavens that declare the glory of God. And so too, in in reality, God's unseen word went forth and created a faith that displays his glory in your life. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so you can see that similar to the world being created by this invisible word of God and displaying his glory, faith is similar to that. And yet this verse is is focused and relevant because for someone who's at a hard place in life who needs encouragement to trust the promises of God that his word will actually come true, This tells them like, hey, remember, not only is God behind everything, his word comes true, but it creates reality. I mean, get this, his word determined the worlds, determined reality in the very beginning. And his word determines reality in the end, just the same. These promises of blessings for you that are to be yours forever 
Promises that are words on a page now will soon be realities on this earth. And you'll live in them. And so when you're tempted by things that you can see around you in the world, this is encouraging you to trust and enjoy his promises more than those sins because one day those promises will be realities as well. Now more than just how we understand the world by faith, faith is displayed also in faithful people. And we see this with a number of examples, three of them to be precise. And we start with, in verse 4, Abel. And Abel answers this question for us about the character of faith in answering what faith sacrifices. It says, By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. It's such a better sacrifice that he actually thereby obtained the testimony that he was righteous. Now, if you ask yourself, what is the source of of this better sacrifice? The answer is faith. Cain did not offer his sacrifice in faith. And it's really the the case that faith was shown horizontally in that he gave, and the word here is a greater sacrifice. It could mean a larger sacrifice, or he gave more, he sacrificed more than Cain, he gave more to God, Genesis describes him in giving pretty much the treasured portions of his possessions to God. But ask yourself, I mean, is that really it? Is it really just the case that if you give more to the ne- than the next guy, that you're going to be righteous? And no, it's, it's not just the, the horizontal display of something, but there is a vertical. There is that faith of what you're treasuring about God. And remember, Abel's stories in Genesis 4... And in Genesis 3, God promised that Christ would come and restore the world and God's people to the abundance of blessing and delight and fellowship with God that they enjoyed in the garden before the fall. And that was very different from the life Abel knew in a cursed world. But as he looked at what God graciously promised in Christ, by faith, Abel enjoyed that more than the treasures that he had from his flock. That's the vertical. And he freely then gave those things to God in worship, which is the horizontal. And so to put it in the language used of the readers in Hebrews 10, he freely gives up the treasures of this world because he knew he had a better possession and a lasting one in Christ. God testified about his gifts and in Genesis 4, it said that God had regard for not only Abel's sacrifice, but Abel himself, because his sacrifice came from a heart of faith. And through faith, even though he's dead, he still is a testimony to us. He still speaks, is what this text says. This is what faith sacrifices. It willfully and joyfully sacrifices the very best things of the world, the best worldly possessions, to honor God. And if someone's clinging to the things of the world, kind of like the rich young ruler in the Gospels, it's very clear that that's not faith. And to be sure, you may have things, but things shouldn't have you. And the way you know is what faith sacrifices, if you're willing to just part with all of it. And these readers, the author says, have already given glimpses that they are making the sacrifice of faith, and that they should be encouraged by that. So next we have Enoch. Moving down the list here, we have Enoch in verses 5 and 6. And in verse 5 and 6, we're going to see kind of the answer to what faith seeks. Not what it sacrifices, but what it seeks. And in short, faith seeks God and his promised blessings. Christ promised them and faith wants them. In other words, we're not just sitting here cold and indifferent while we wait for the promises of God to come to pass. Like Abel, Enoch had faith, faith in Christ. He enjoyed the vertical relationship and the treasuring of what God promised him in Christ. And what's interesting here is that God shows up dramatically and delivers on his promise to bring Abel, or sorry, Enoch into fellowship with himself. 
Enoch was taken up so that he wouldn't even see death. He was taken into eternal life right away. And he was not found because God took him up. He was rewarded. He didn't even die. And before then, the interesting thing is, this text says God did that because before then, you could see the horizontal display of his faith. He walked with God and pleased him. He obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. The way that's rendered in the Old Testament Hebrew is that he walked with God. And interestingly, only one man is indicated to walk with God before Enoch. That's Adam. Adam, who had fellowship with God in the garden. Sin broke that fellowship and ejected man out of the garden in the presence of God. But Enoch, in the Bible, is showing us that faith is the way back to that kind of fellowship with God. And verse 6 explains this more. Now, just remember verse 6 and the truths there for your whole life as we read it. It says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Because he who comes to God, he who seeks God, must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. And friends, if you're not saved or if you're fighting for clarity on what real faith is like and what it does, consider this verse. It's very illuminating. Many people think of going to God only to give and sacrifice for God. But if that's all you think about, this text says God's not pleased with that. You have to go to God to get. You have to go to God to receive his grace, to seek his grace, to be yours by his gifting. You cannot go to God to show off to give him something he doesn't have. That's, that doesn't honor God. That only allows man to boast. But if we come with faith that seeks to get what he's promised, we're like Enoch. This is what Enoch did. And this is what the author of Hebrews has actually already told his readers to do. He says, go to the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace in time of need. In other words, draw near to God to get what you don't have to get the strength you need, to get the grace you need, to get the love you need. Faith seeks what God is giving in Christ. So you can see what faith sacrifices. It's willing to just part with all the world to have what God's promised in Christ. You can see what faith seeks, that it seeks the enjoyment of God and the presence of God. And lastly, in verse 7, we have Noah. Noah is an interesting testimony here. He answers the question of where faith stands. By faith, it says Noah took a stand in God's grace and against the world and sin. It says, by faith, Noah being warned about things not yet seen in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness, which is according to to faith. And if you remember, Noah lived in an unspeakably evil time. You remember, you've read it. Noah had faith in Christ. He had faith. And he walked with God like Enoch did. Moses writes about that. But the focus here is that God promised judgment was coming for the ungodly. And though Noah couldn't see it, He didn't turn a deaf ear to it. Being warned by God about things not yet seen through the word of God, his response was reverence and preparation. He accepted the promise of salvation that God would save him and his household and it changed the whole course of his life. That he would save Noah and his family and yet that he would judge the whole world. Noah's life changed because of that word to where he worked toward nothing else. That's the horizontal side of things. And in Genesis, you see that Noah took about 75 years to build a boat in the woods when it had never rained. And he was telling everyone of God's judgment and not one of them listened. 
the world just ridiculed and mocked him for 75 years. Can you imagine 75 years of preparing for what you've never seen and telling people and having nobody listen to you? And yet Noah never gave in and went back to the world. With faith in God's word, he took his stand. And in preparing the ark for the salvation of his household, that goal to which he was preparing for, in doing that, he took his stand to condemn the world, the text says. He became thereby an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. That's what faith does. Faith takes that kind of stand to say, the world is deserving of judgment, and so am I, but to stand in grace and to know that God is gracious and God is your salvation. That's what faith does. And you know what? One day, God's word of judgment became reality on the earth, and his word of salvation became reality in the ark, in time and space, and all that hardship was worth it. And the readers are in a place much like Noah. They have a message, they have hope, they have this promise, this warning of judgment that's coming upon the world, and life for them is long and hard and difficult for a lot of reasons. And sometimes going the way of the world and just giving back in to just stand in the world looks pretty easy and looks pretty nice. But the author says... That by faith, Noah was accepted by God and welcomed into eternity with him. God began a good work in Noah and carried him through all of that by his grace. So the author is saying, since you have faith, a faith that sacrifices, a faith that sees, a faith that seeks God, and a faith that takes its stand against the world, you'll make it too. Because you stand in his grace. So he's saying keep looking toward the reward because God is faithful. He's been faithful with Noah, with Enoch, with Abel. And what we're going to see is with a lot, a lot more people. One day his promise, just like it did for them, will become reality in time and space. And you'll be with God forever. So this is the horizontal and vertical aspects of faith that are true in every Christian. And this is how we're going to be reading through Hebrews 11. And I hope this is encouraging to you, and I hope the questions help guide you in your study of this text.